focusing on the breath, trying to get the mind to stay with the breath, it can sometimes be a very chastening experience. In the first level, simply with the difficulty of getting the mind to stay with one thing. Something as simple and nearby as the breath, and you find it slipping off, slipping off, slipping off. You start out with the best of intentions, and you're going to stay for the whole hour. Or if you found that aiming at the whole hour seems too much, you say, okay, for five minutes I'm going to stay right here. Two seconds later you're off someplace else. And this even if you've been meditating for a long time. So the first lesson is simply how much the mind can deceive itself. Something else seems to slip in, pull a burlap sack over your head, and you're off someplace else when you come out of the sack. So even though this is chastening, don't let it get discouraging. It simply means that you've got to be more watchful over your own mind. Your mind can play tricks on you. And exactly who this mind is that's playing tricks and who you are, put that aside for the time being. Just learn how to identify with your intention to stay right here. In one of John Munn's final Dharma talks, reported by John Mahabua. John Munn is quoted as saying that this is one thing you never let go of, is your determination to get past suffering. There may be all kinds of other difficulties, other things you've got to let go of. But hold on to this for the time being, until it's taken you there, then you let go. So identify with this determination. You're going to stay here with the breath, and then see what else comes up. And remind yourself, no, we're not going to go there. And then you look for the signs. What are the signs of a mind that's about to slip off? And you seem to be with the breath, but you're getting bored. You say, well, there must be something else around here. And how does the mind do that? And then how does it pretend to itself that it's not doing that? Look for that. Be aware that it's happening. And as soon as you sense that it's happening, remind yourself, hey, there's plenty to gain interest here in the breath. This is one of the reasons why I stuck with the John Lee's method, because it's not simply you know, in, out, in, out, in, out, 3,000 times. Watch how the breath comes in. Where do you feel it? What different ways do you feel it? Where does it feel good in the body? Where does it feel harsh? What ways of breathing build up tension, say, in the neck, in the back, in the shoulders? What ways of breathing can release that tension? In other words, use the breath as something to explore. You've got this breath energy here that's keeping you alive. It only stands to reason that this basic force of life, if it's going to be comfortable and nourishing feeling, is going to be better for you than if it feels strained and tense. And disagreeable, which means, of course, you've got to learn how to pay more attention to it. And if you find it interesting, it gets easier and easier to stay. That part of your mind that's looking for entertainment, or at least looking for something new, something to learn about things, you can focus it here. There's a lot to learn about this breath energy in the body. And John Lee sometimes talks about six different kinds of breath energy in the body. The Buddha mentions different aspects of the wind element in the body. There's the upflowing breath, which John Lee interprets as a sense of energy that's constantly flowing up from the feet up to the head. And then there's a downflowing breath, which is the one that goes from the head down to the feet and out. There's the wind in the intestines, the wind in the stomach. 
the sense of energy that flows throughout the whole body. And there's the in and out breath. And they're all connected in different ways. You can explore that. So when you're talking about breath, it's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's the whole feeling of energy you have. When you close your eyes, how do you feel the energy in your body? What different types of energy are there? Some energy just stays very still. Other energy seems to spin around in place. Some of it moves back and forth. There's lots to explore here. This is where the experience of being with the breath can be chastening as well, because once you settle in here, you realize how you've ignored this whole area of your awareness. You begin to see the potential for well-being that's right here that you've overlooked. That's a chastening experience. And then you can use this as a foundation to look at other ways you pursue pleasure in your life, through relationships, through sensual pleasures, through the desire to gain this, to get that, become this, become that. And you realize that you can get a lot of the sense of well-being that you want. It's simply by sitting here breathing. We can turn and look at your other forms of pleasure. Pleasure based on greed, pleasure based on aversion, pleasure based on delusion. That can be very chastening as well. There's a word in Pali, Sangwega, which is very difficult to translate into English. Part of it is a sense of dismay looking at your life. Realizing how you've been spending a lot of time pursuing mirages. And not only that, but also causing harm to yourself and other people in the process. A sense of dismay, you feel chastened. At the same time, there's a sense of urgency that goes along with it, realizing that you're trapped in this selfish and blind pursuit, and you want to find a way out. So sometimes Sangwag is translated as urgency. It's a combination of all these things. When we read about the Buddha's life story, this is the feeling he had after seeing the old person, the sick person, and the dead person, realizing that all the pleasures he'd been pursuing ended right there. This is where they lead you. You can imagine the sense of anguish he felt. That's the popular version of the story. The, the one that you read about the canon is a little bit more believable. It's not the case that he never saw an old person or a sick person, a dead person in his life. He'd seen them many times, but like most of us, he just accepted that as normal. Until one day it really hit him. This is where he was going to end up. And all of his pleasures were going to grind to a halt right there. Everything was going to fall apart right there. And the question rose in his mind, is there some, way, some other way out? Is there a pleasure? This is our happiness. That doesn't have to end with these things. That's when he saw the forest wanderer. So, well, if there's a way out, it's can be found through this, going off into the wilderness, being alone, looking inside the mind to see what other potentials for happiness lie in there. Because the pleasures of the senses reach their limit right here. It hit me the other day. I was planning the design for another book cover, and thought suddenly struck me, someday I'm going to get so old, my eyes are going to be so bad, I won't be able to see these anymore. get to the point where I won't be able to hear the Dharma anymore. So 
So even the pleasures that come out of artistic activity, your own creations, they're not going to be around for you all the time, and you're not going to be able to appreciate them all the time. The question is, what have you got left? So you really have to look into the mind. That was the young prince's insight. And so the feeling he felt at that point in Basada, a sense of confidence, clarity. This must be the way out. It's this combination of Sangwega and Vasada that fires your practice, but at the same time keeps it from getting discouraged. There is a way out, and we've got the rest of the Buddhist story to remind us that, yes, he did find the way out, and it was something based on qualities that we all have within us, potentially. As you said, it was because he was ardent, heedful, and resolute. Heedful relates to that sense of some way, realizing there are dangers in life. But heedfulness also builds on the idea that your actions do make a difference. If you're careful about what you do, you can protect yourself. If we're all doomed, then it wouldn't matter how heedful we were. If life were like a big flow of lava that came and crushed everything in its path, no matter what, regardless of what we did, then heedfulness wouldn't matter. But the fact that there is a way out and it's based on our own actions, that's why we have to be heedful. Ardent and resolute means okay, once you've made up your mind you're going to stick with this path, you really do it no matter what. And you use all your ingenuity when you run up against obstacles. You sit there and watch them for a while and figure out, okay, what's the obstacle here? What's the way around it? They've done psychological studies of people who are extremely skillful in different fields, and they found it's a combination of one, having a strong sense of the danger and drawbacks that can come if you aren't skillful, if you're careless. They talk about one of the best surgeons, one of the best brain surgeons in America, who realized that he, was, he had a weak point in his surgical technique, which was dealing with aneurysms. And so he practiced every day, for day after day after day, for months, inducing little aneurysms in little rats, and then operating on them. Because realizing that if you were very careless in how you operate on an aneurysm, you could kill somebody, or if you didn't kill them, they'd be paralyzed. So sensing that danger, he worked on this again and again and again. The other side of ardency and resolution, though, they discovered, is having a strong sense of the rewards that come when you really do things well. And it's taking joy in overcoming obstacles. This is what keeps the path from becoming dry and what keeps the effort from being a chore and drudgery. Try to develop the attitude. If there's an obstacle, you're going to be able to handle it. And try to find joy in figuring out different ways of approaching it, different ways of getting around the obstacle. And let's try to find a way in which the practice can capture your imagination. In this case, think about the possibilities of the breath. We in the West don't often think about the breath energy in the body. We've heard about chi, we've heard about prana. But our culture hasn't really cultivated that aspect of our experience. So here's an opportunity for you to explore it, to see what you can learn about both the body and the mind as you do this. So the meditation is not simply a matter of technique, it's also a matter of the qualities of mind you bring to it. The combination of sangweg and basada, the combination of heedfulness, ardency, resolution.
and the element of joy. So if your practice seems to be reaching an impasse, ask yourself, which of these aspects are you missing? Are you getting complacent or are you getting discouraged? And once you can identify the problem, okay, try to build a conviction that, yes, there is a way around this. After all, many people in the past have done this. And it wasn't the matter. It wasn't the case that they were all great intellects or fierce warriors from birth. They're human beings just like us. With all our strengths and weaknesses, sometimes worse weaknesses than we have now, and yet they were able to find the strengths they needed to get past these problems. If they could do it, you can do it too.